the frozen track in the high plateau of Kyrgyzstan, a small truck is on the move. In these extreme conditions, the truck is beginning its journey to deliver the so-called fruit of happiness to the remotest villages. For the New Year's celebrations, children here receive just one present, one they've been thinking of all year round, these rare clementines. <laughs> Father Christmas has come. To get to the villages at the end of the earth, the drivers faced off with a titan. The Pamir Massif, with some of the largest glaciers on earth. The 7,000 meter tall summits have beaten back the most savage of would-be invaders. It's a no man's land where only the strongest can survive the forces of nature. In the heart of Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan is squeezed between two giants, China and Kazakhstan. Only one mountain road, 413 kilometers long, links Osh in the west of the country to bordering Tajikistan. Look, there's a truck. Came off the road, it's at Zil. With only the cold, the snow and each other for company, two men try and survive in this immense wilderness. Go on, go on, we need to get going. How are we gonna get through this? It's cold. Osh is Kyrgyzstan's second city, with the largest mosque in the country. It's staunchly Muslim. After nightfall, the two adventurers are on a wasteland to stock up on supplies. They've bought some expensive Chinese clementines from a local trader. The drivers hope to sell them for a profit in Tajikistan. The truck is overloaded with cases full of the fruit. They've placed a simple cover over the fruit to protect it from the cold, along with some plywood and wooden beams someone has ordered from them. The loading completed, the two men head off into the night darkness. My name's Kuban. And he's Duisho. Duisho is the driver and mechanic and Kuban, the senior of the two, is in charge. The two appeal to the heavens for a safe journey ahead. It's our tradition. We ask God for his help on the long road, and especially that we arrive without any problems. Outside, it's minus 20 degrees, and not much warmer inside the cabin, where the heating isn't working. It snowed a lot this year. It snowed early. And there's far too much snow. And then there's black ice all over the road. <coughs> and it's cold, that's why he's ill. And the clementines mustn't be allowed to freeze. We'll get some cigarettes and bread at the store. May God keep you warm. Okay, thanks. See you. So what are you waiting for? It's not opening. Go, go look on the other side. The sub-zero temperatures have frozen the doors. Oh, 
The handle's stuck. And I don't even have a key. If that happens to you on the road, you'll freeze. Take your coat off. You might be able to reach then. The door's still stuck. We can't open it. I want to get out, but I, but I can't. It's a very old truck, you know. Now look, it's, it's the cable that links everything. It's inside the door. It's ripped. The four-wheel drive that dates back to Soviet days is on its last legs. But it still has a few tricks left. The weather is getting worse by the hour. Along the road, the freezing conditions have already claimed some victims. This is where the hard part begins. Damn, there's too much snow. We can't see anything in all this fog. It's already foggy here. I hate to think what the pass is like. We're going to the Tadeldik Pass. It's a very dangerous place. 3,600 meters, and in a blizzard, only the strongest can make it. Damn it, there's a jam here. At minus 30, the road is an ice rink, and the truckers have to cope as best as they can. So what's wrong? We're stuck. How will you get through? I don't know, I'll try with some earth. <laughs> the traffic's backed up for hundreds of meters. The trucks in the front are unable to get up the slope and they've brought the traffic to a standstill. And there's no one here to help or put soil on the road surface. But one road mender is working. I can't clear it on my own. We don't have the equipment. It's very difficult to dig up earth when it's frozen like this. In his little truck, Dusho risks it and manages to thread his way through. Unlike this brand new Jeep. It's Kuban and Duisho's old truck that comes to the rescue. It's cold and it's humid. Oh, it's awful. We'll try and help them. We'll see. <laughs> Bayağı var. Hasta odan kapat. 
The ancient truck has plenty of faults, but it's a four-wheel drive and as strong as a tractor. Their good Samaritan work over, the two men head off again. Elsewhere, another struggle is taking place. In the valley at the foot of the mountains, a hundred or so men are preparing to challenge each other at Kokboru, the local sport. <laughs> Only the Jigits, the bravest men, whether young or old, are invited to take part. <laughs> You use a goat carcass, see, that's had its intestines removed. The holes then stitch up and you conserve it in snow. And then you can play with a carcass on horseback. And Mr. Cosmos finances the game. He's superstitious and hopes that God will then grant him his wish to have a son and heir. <laughs> My friend Cosmos is organizing it and hoping that people will give their blessing so he can have a son. He's only got four daughters. The idea is that the strongest man and horse will seize the carcass. The winner will be called Hercules. Only one man can win. People who are drunk or are alcoholics are not allowed to play. Oh, there are injuries, but they're never very serious. To win at Kokboru, some horsemen are prepared to invest a lot of money. I bought my horse when it was four years old for $10,000. And I've won a prize every year. <laughs> Dusho and Kuban have no time to watch the Kokburu. This time they stop to help a taxi that's broken down. It's the belt that's broken. That's a problem. Problem, it's the only word I know. So I repeat it over and over. <laughs> Uh, it's a fan belt, my friend. It's torn. We'll take him to the next village, otherwise he might freeze. <laughs> no, the repairs will cost me about $2,000. It's a disaster for me. To make up for it, I'll have to make five or six long trips. Once again, it's the indestructible Soviet four-wheel drive that gets them out of trouble. The temperature drops still further at night. And the taxi passenger is worried. He is unlikely to be reassured by Dushov. The blizzards, oh, that's the worst thing on this road. It's what's causing all these problems. It's 35 below outside, it's very, very cold. Let's hope we don't break down. Uh, what happens if you do break down? Well, if I stay in the vehicle, I'll die of hyperthermia. A breakdown in such conditions would mean certain death. Why are you asking me to hold the gear stick? Because when I get into second gear, there's a problem. If you let go, we won't be able to stop and we'll have an accident. OK, I'll, I'll hang on to it then. Without heating, the windscreen is soon covered with ice and Dusho can barely see the road that is edged with precipices. The temperature is now minus 37 degrees. Desperate measures are called for and an old blowtorch acts as a de-icing device. It's cold. I'm cold. 
Fire against ice. Within a few kilometers, though, the ice is back. Forced to stop, the little frozen group seeks shelter. Hello. Can you can you put us up? There's no room. All ten beds are already taken. <laughs> At a loss, Dusho has little choice but to move on. Skirting the abyss and with the frequent use of the blowtorch, they finally reach a house. There are a few lights shining at a farm in the middle of nowhere. The welcome is glacial. Inside, it's about 10 degrees. But then, traditional Kyrgyzstani hospitality kicks in. Thank you for allowing us in during the storm, my friend, and letting us stay here until it passes. You're welcome. It's a Kyrgyzstani tradition to host people. Well, we saw some wolves in the village. And they were eating a donkey. Ah, well, there are always wolves when it gets cold and starts to snow. And afterwards they ate two sheep. Nobody knows how they got to them. Well, they've got nothing to eat out on the steps. While Kuban makes do with cold water, the truck needs a dose of the blowtorch. The engine has frozen solid overnight. Got to take care of this. Uh, I don't want the track to catch fire, do I? works with petrol and heats up quickly. Got to be careful. Later, the radiator needs refilling. The water having been removed the night before to stop it freezing. There we go. This is boiling water and, God willing, we'll be able to get going. It's to make it start up more easily. Now we have to heat up the radiator as well. The old truck rattles off towards the Kizilat Pass, altitude 4,280 meters. Oh, 
Now, this is where the roads get bad. Look, that's where a truck came off the road. It's a zil. In the ravine, the remains of a truck that once belonged to a driver they know well. I hope there were no dead or injured. Well, they're not there anymore, anyway. You see how hard it is for us truckers? I don't know if he died. Only God knows. Kuban and Duisho enter the frozen desert of Pamir, where even the snow doesn't stick because of the violent winds. I'm tired, I'm sleepy, and it's cold too. Yeah, if we want to go up, we're going to have to accelerate. The way to do it is to zigzag, you see? It's to stop it stalling. It's a steep slope and we need to climb it. Choke, 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 go, go. Victory. We're managing to get two tons over the pass. This is a strong engine. It's powerful, powerful. It's dead. We'll have to push. Like I told you, we've had it. Oh, we can't get going again, it's crap. At this altitude and without oxygen, the motor can't function. But they have a solution. And now I need to change the carburetor. To drive up here, it needs replacing. The truck won't make this climb as there's not enough oxygen. And to increase power, we'll use a different carburetor. Yeah, this is what our life is all about. I'll put in this carburetor and off we go. So will you put the other one back in after the pass? Well, we have to, to save on petrol. Because it uses less. <laughs> this carburetor is getting on my nerves. Oh, I'm getting fed up with this rotten truck. Well, you see, th this way we'll save up to 10 to 15 litres of fuel up there. And that's worth almost $15, and that makes a big difference. But for $15, we will lose an hour and a half. The carburetor's changed, and the tactic works. Go on, go on, we need to get going. Go on, get in. But as usual, the door's stuck. But there's no way they'll risk stopping, so Kuban continues on foot. We're too high up, there's no oxygen. This is the climb. We'll have to do it, step by step. We have to get up. Uh, I've got a headache as well. Hop. Okay. After an hour, they have somehow or other reached their objective. The Kizilad Pass. 
one of only two crossing points between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Less than a dozen vehicles a day risk this passage. This is the border with Tajikistan. They'll do an inspection here. It's the Kizilat Pass. The border controls and customs are here. Oh, it's really cold. It's 30 degrees below, and the customs officers are too cold to leave their offices. Dusho and Kuban finally make it into Tajikistan. Finally, a descent, but not for long. The rear wheels are just spinning uselessly. It's no longer working. The drive shaft has a problem. Can you unscrew it? Yes, yes, that's, that's the way. G give me the 14 and the 17 keys. If we repair, great. If not, we're stuck. Some of the nuts have fallen off. It's the shaft that goes to the rear wiper. We'll repair it and, well, we'll get going. A part of the shaft drive has fallen off. What a mess. It fell, but, but where? There's a nut missing, you see? And the shaft's broken. We've lost a nut somewhere around here. It's a nut from the drive shaft. Have you found it? No, I haven't found it. No, it's just one bad news after another. Forget it, you're not going to find anything down there. Without the part, it's impossible to change the drive shaft. So Kuban and Dusho decide on a more radical solution, freewheeling down the mountain. Damn, we have to change the rear wiper shaft. Can, can you drive without it? Yes, with God's help. We're almost through the Abkatal Pass. It's nearly finished. Straight ahead, it's Murgab. <laughs> Their lives depend on the old brakes. Not that they're going easy on them. <laughs> We're carrying two tons of goods. Each kilo is worth 20 cents. So that's more than $420 worth altogether. And we need to buy spare parts for $280. And whatever's left is ours. So we'll share $70 for him and $70 for me. But Kuban's forgotten the petrol, which will be at least $300. So the two men will be out of pocket. Go on, drive like that. After two days, the men finally make it into the deserts of Murga, altitude 3,600 meters. Kuban and Dusho were born here. This is the center of Murgab. Come on, get going. In Tajikistan, Lenin still holds a place of honor in what is the poorest of all the former Soviet republics and one of the poorest countries in the world. The average salary is barely $75 a month. It's frozen. Let's check it. <laughs> yep, it's all iced up. No surprise given that it's been so cold. The clementines still look good though. Well, we better sell them straight away in the market. Oh, 
Load them up carefully, don't squash them. Traditionally, commerce in Kyrgyzstan is a family affair. Each member has a part to play. It's up to Kuban's mother to sell the fruits. I'm off to the market. I'll sell them for the New Year's holiday. In Mugab, construction materials are too expensive, so traders set up shop in containers. The Clementines finally make it. But with little money around, there's no rush to buy. They have to be sold as quickly as possible. Come here, come here, buy some clementines. They're excellent, full of vitamins. Going cheap, buy them for their vitamins. How much? Ten cents. We only get vitamins once a year. My children had hepatitis, so I buy them whenever I can find any. It's already midday. May God protect us so we can sell them before it gets dark. In these parts, clementines are usually kept for special occasions. Do you have any clementines? It's for a family party. One kilo, please, but be quick. Please. The kilo of clementines will adorn a traditional Kyrgyzstani meal. The celebration of a birth. Families and in-laws will dip into their budgets for these enormous feasts. It's the Gentek, a party to welcome the birth of a firstborn, as well as welcome happiness into the house. It's the custom. The young mother stays with her parents before the birth of the child. Then the newborn stays there for its first 40 days. The child is placed in a crib, and when it gets used to it, it's taken back to the father's house. It's a ritual that only women perform, with a crib in a room where the men are not allowed. We'll put the child in the crib. And then under the crib, there's a carpet. And now we'll put her in the crib so she can sleep. The baby is carefully wrapped up to protect it from the cold in these poorly heated houses. Next comes the moment the children have all been waiting for. The blessing with sweets is to bring prosperity for the baby and his parents. Finally, it's time for the Clementines to bring the child happiness throughout her life. Her name's Aya. My aunts, my uncles, all bring presents. All of them will wish her to be strong and healthy. After the meal, as an offering, 
family and friends share the food. <laughs> We distribute the meat in the traditional way. The, the head goes to the father-in-law, who is the oldest and most respected person. The tailbone goes to the mother-in-law. Whatever's left is shared among the other guests. Duisho, meanwhile, is back on the road. Along with some friends, he's looking for anything that burns to heat up his family's house. We're looking for some bushes to keep us warm. We'll find them in the desert. The road is long, it's 40 kilometers. Bushes burn well. In Mugab, it's really cold. But the shrubs are too small around here. We have to go further out. There aren't many left as everyone comes here to pick them up. There are no trees here. They can't grow, the ground's just too dry. These are our trees. When it's cold, it's exhausting, and, and when it snows, it's even worse. But we have to collect them even when it, it does snow. We don't have any coal, and we couldn't afford it anyway. 50 kilos of coal is about $8, and for that I can buy petrol and collect these bushes. I can sell some and make a bit of money. <sighs> the men each take their share back home. It's enough to last for a week. Shrubs don't provide as much heat as coal and barely raise the temperature in the room. For Kuban and Duisho, business is not going well. They're having trouble selling off the clementines. So, what should we do tomorrow? Well, we need to buy some petrol. They're not making much profit at the moment. What with all the breakdowns, we're, we're spending too much money. Oh, we will make a profit. We just need to pray. Good.
the next day, they set out again with fresh ideas. They found out that Kyrgyzstani nomads are selling yaks, and they might be able to sell the meat at the Afghani border. Well, at this point, uh, there are some yaks for sale. One or two good yaks. Yeah, and we could make some good money. Yeah, of course. We'll find some good customers. There are no phones out here. To check instead, you have to go out and look for yourselves. And there's a nasty surprise. as the herd of yaks has been moved to other pastures. The remaining shepherds hitch a ride on the truck. We move four times a year. There's the summer, autumn and winter pastures. Four seasons and four routes. He wants to sleep. Oh, you can sleep in the truck. <laughs> it's yet another detour for the old truck. The nomads and their herds are far from the beaten track. So you've been married for two years? Yes. And that's your son? Yes. Does he have the same name as his father? Oh, yeah. I've named him Muzin, like his father. Under the Soviets, the nomads were restricted. The herdsmen were only allowed onto predetermined areas. Today, they're semi-nomadic and still live in these huts made from earth and clay. There's no key, we forgot it. We'll open it in the time-tested Kyrgyzstani method. Done, open. It's up to the client to choose his own yak. Uh, which one should we take? Well, we'll, we'll choose a big one. And where are the big ones? There, take that one in the center. That's a good animal. Go on then. Well, what are you asking for it? Well, that'll be four hundred dollars. Oh, we won't make any profit for that much. Well, three seventy-five then. Three hundred seventy-five won't even cover our petrol. It's a long drive. Sell it to us for three fifty. But then I won't make any money for that. Come on, we've helped you move, and we'll help you again often. Okay, I'll count on you to transport us next time. <laughs> The men agree the deal and start sharpening their knives. The animal itself, though, has not agreed. It's hard to get hold of it. It moves and it can hit you really quickly. The yak stages one final dance of death with the two men. Be careful! <laughs> we haven't really earned much, and the sale of the meat will just about cover our costs. <laughs> 
There you go. You've made your profit, and now I want to find a good buyer myself. There's just one road to the Afghani border. This narrow mountainside path. A route which only drug traffickers or dealers and other goods dare use as they cross from Afghanistan on the other side of these summits. There's black ice now, it'll be really difficult. There's few vehicles, it's too dangerous. They have to drive very slowly. Stay well over to the right. Seventy soldiers were on a bus along here. And now the pass is called Farewell to Youth because the bus fell into the ravine and exploded. Where did they fall? There, I think. Did the bus slide or something? Yeah, I think so. Oh, it's like an ice rink, isn't it? I slid once after I lost control. Oh, luckily, though, I was able to stop the truck. This is very high up. It's really terrifying. We've got families and kids. Who's going to take care of them? After one final curve, they pull into Ishkashim, the door to Afghanistan. On the other side of the river lies the first bastions of the fierce Afghan tribes. There's no road, just mule tracks dug out of the rock with pickaxes. Kuban and Dusha are decidedly unlucky. Someone's beaten them to it. The coal store is already full. I bought a lot of meat just yesterday, and, and besides, I can't keep it for long. So why would I buy more? If it was mutton, I'd buy it. Get me some of that next time. Okay, see you soon. Kuban makes the best of a bad deal. What a mess. What a laugh. We can't even sell the meat. Huh? Ever the fatalist, he catches up with some friends at the only inn in the village. <laughs> Come on, let's drink to our health and peace and happiness. All the best things. <laughs> We like our life here, it's good. Come on, let's dance. 
Kuban and Duisho continue on to Kolog, hoping to sell their yak meat there. All right, come on, let's go to Kolog. Yes, we'll need some more petrol. Well, you know what they say, he who risks nothing will never sip champagne. <laughs> 